have had some conversations with, uh, with some folks uh, very early on. Really, really interesting uh, comments and questions uh, have been raised regarding the training. Um, you guys are a really uh, astute group uh, because the, the, the depth of the questions uh, reflect serious thoughtfulness about the meaning of this, uh, this training, uh, both at a professional level and a personal level. And one of the questions um, that was raised this morning was a question and a comment. Was in our use of the POI model, we have definitions for the traits or the mental health standards and we have corresponding definitions for their distortions. And so the question was raised, is there only one definition for a mental health standard? And is there only one definition for its distortion? And the example was given um, with the mental health standard trust. The distortion of trust in the curriculum is imbalance. And so uh, I was asked, well, imbalance seems almost kind of um, a very short and not really deep distortion given some of the kinds of behaviors that people have seen in their clinical experience relative to trust in relationships. And what I uh, said was, one way to think about this process is that it is a way, not the way. It's very important to recognize that when we're doing this work, for every word that we use in terms of mental health standards or traits and their distortions, there are a plethora of definitions that could be incorporated to define the meaning of the word. We provide you with a definition that is consistently used in the programming aspect of this around the country. Because one of the considerations that we have in our work is that it's being evaluated in more than one place. It's being examined. We're looking for outcomes. We're trying to make sure that the process is consistent. So we recognize that you have many definitions, for example, for trust. And when we talk about trust, what we say is trust is less an issue of what we put in other people. In fact, trust is fundamentally defined as having the confidence that you will be well no matter what you encounter regardless of what any other person does. It's not about somebody else when we talk about trust. And most people are familiar with trust being defined as whether or not I can trust you to do the right thing. Can I trust you with my secrets? May, am I able to trust you with what's important to me? Can I trust you as my spouse not to cheat on me? We do not define trust in that way at all. In fact, we say that is almost the antithesis of trust. We say that trust has singularly and most importantly to do with your ability to be well no matter what circumstance you face in your life, no matter what challenge you encounter, you have an innate ability to be well. Does it mean you will not get help? No. Does it mean that you will not need help? No. It means that you are confident. It means that you learn to recognize that you have internal resources to draw upon to be well. And we say that that is the center of our sense of balance. So this wellness has to do with spiritual, moral, emotional, physical balance. A sense of inner balance. So when we talk about its distortion as imbalance, what we suggest is a way of thinking about the distortion of trust 
is to imagine oneself as being unbalanced in one's life, where you have an over-reliance on other people in your definition of trust. We're always pushing folks to own their own stuff rather than to have reason to think that their challenges are someone else's problem or are emanating from someone else. Even if someone else is doing something that you are uncomfortable with, your response to it is more important than what they do. It's critical to keep that in mind, and especially in this work that we're doing called reentry. We're, we're working with a population generally that has long, they have long histories of placing blame outside oneself. But the irony is that that's the condition for most of us. <laughs> when things go wrong, we tend to look at other people and other things as the reason for things going wrong. So I want to emphasize it is a way of understanding the work that we do. Indefinite article, A. It is not the way, definite article. We understand that. Now the other part of this that I've not introduced to you regarding the source for the mental health standards. The source for them come from the work called Hamblatia. Hamblatia. The Hamblatia, it is a Native American concept. It is adapted from the Lakota. And the practice is called the circle of courage. Hamblatia, depending on how the word is pronounced, means either quest for vision or cry for vision. Quest for vision or cry for vision. And the emphasis in talking about the Hamblatia is, a, is on recognizing that all of us, all human beings, are on a journey. Regardless of who you are, what your color is, what your ethnic background may be, what your financial status is, whether or not you've used drugs, not used drugs, been in the church all your life, a saint, no matter who you are, we are all on a journey. That is the Hamblatia. And it is a quest for vision. It's not just an abstract journey. It's a very concrete journey. And we're tied to each other. We're connected to each other in a way that's fundamentally human. It's not gender specific. It's not race specific. It's none of those things. It speaks to the human condition. So the journey is the Hamblatia. The circle of courage represents four quadrants. It's represented in four stages. The first stage is belonging. Belonging. The second stage is mastery. The third stage is independence. And the fourth stage is generosity. And in each one of these stages, what we have is seven traits that characterize each stage. Seven traits. 
the seven traits of belonging are the traits that you have in the psychology of incarceration that are connected to the seven criminogenic needs domains. So we adapted this model of human well-being from the Lakota with the recognition that people who commit crimes, who engage in antisocial behavior, we look at that beyond the social definition. What, we're looking, what we see is anti-human behavior. People who hurt people as a consequence of what Franco calls moral deformity are lacking something very clear to us and that is a sense of belonging. When one loses their sense of belonging and they become alienated spiritually and emotionally from other people, it leads to hurtful, anti-human violent behavior. That's why we use the traits or mental health standards from belonging because we say the first thing that has to happen is we have to connect with people. We have to encourage them to feel a sense of belonging. So all of our work in terms of the healing aspects of the psychology of incarceration is focused on creating a sense of belonging. Now let me show you at a very practical level how it works. I want to give you an example. Having spent many years in prison, in maximum security prisons, with extremely violent individuals, one of the things that stood out to me over the years was I knew guys in prison who had multiple murders, multiple stabbings while in prison, horrific violent behavior on a daily basis inside prison. The prison did not stop the violence. It continued. In fact, in many cases, it escalated in prison. And I would see guys who were excessively violent inside the prison compound on visits. And there's one guy in particular that really stands out to me who was known for having stabbed several individuals during his incarceration, had been locked up about 22, 23 years, um, just a very violent person. And one day I was on a <laughs> visit, and he was on the visit um, with me. His mother was about 4 feet 11. And I remember she came in the visiting room because I was already out there. She came in the visiting room. And when he came out into the visiting room, she stood up and she said, sit down. I hear you've been acting up in here. We're, now, we, no one wanted to look at him too close because we knew the consequences. When you go back inside, you're going to have to deal with boo-boo. <laughs> boo-boo, sit down. See, his nickname from childhood for her. 411. He said, Oh, Ma, why, don't do that. She said, Don't you start. Don't make me act up out here in this visiting room. The way she treated him was so amazing to me. This little four foot something woman that was his mother. He was the most nonviolent, passive individual that you might imagine. You would never have put this guy in the visiting room with his mother with the character that we saw on a daily basis inside the prison. And for years I thought about what is it that would make this guy so violent inside and so passive and reasonable out here in the visiting room. It was his sense of connectedness to his mother. It was his sense of belonging. It was his sense of relationship to her that prevented him from being the violent person that he was with people he did not belong. He did not feel a sense of connection to. All of us know in our personal lives 
the people we feel closest to, most connected with, particularly in the healthy sense, are the ones that we are most kind and loving and patient and tolerant with. When we understand how this applies beyond our personal life, our personal vignette, we can see application in the broader context of human behavior. So we were very deliberate in selecting the stage of belonging from the Native American practice of, of the Hamblatia, particularly the circle of courage, because the circle of courage represents the path. The Hamblatia is the journal, but the circle is the journey, but the circle of courage is the path. And the power of the path is that every person, I don't care if you have the same mother and father raised in the same home, have had the same food all your life, went to the same schools, read the same books, attended the same church, had the same clothes, everyone has a different path. It could be your twin, identical twin, and she or he will have a different path than you. None of us have the same path, but we all are on the same journey. That is to say, a journey. So we recognize that because we're on different paths, but we all share our lives on the, in the journey of life, then what we found is the most important thing to do is help people feel like they belong. Once they feel that they belong, wondrous things happen. You can look up Circle of Courage and you'll see, the, I mean, there's just pages and pages and pages about this practice. It's not an off-the-cuff practice. We didn't arrive accidentally at these mental health standards. It's not an off-the-cuff idea to suggest that these standards are important and that there are distortions there and why we look at it the way that we do. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands where it comes from. Khalil didn't just kind of get up one morning and say, hey, what about attachment? And, and what about, hey, you know, what about trust at the end here? No, I didn't do that. We looked around. And we saw a model that spoke to human well-being. And it's not an accident that the first stage that we focus on is belonging. Because... When you want to help people, more important than the help you want to give them is that they feel a sense of connectedness to you. That's what you do first. It was like the parable of, 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 of Jesus and, and the people were coming to hear him and they were crowding around and the disciples said, well, what are we going to do? They're hungry and he said, feed them. <laughs> I'd like to give you a great sermon, but you're hungry. Let me feed you. The food, the feeding them is more important than the sermon. If people come to you in desperate need of help, address their immediate needs. You don't have to lecture them first. It's going to be okay. They will hear you. They, I promise you they will. Let them know that you care. You'll get to your clinical diagnosis. I promise you that the DSM-4 is not going anywhere. <laughs> I promise you it's not. <laughs> it will be there when you get through eating with them. Give yourself pay some, just a little bit of room to just be a decent person with them. And out of that, other things evolve. And they will be much more likely to hear you, to be patient with you, to help you work through your stuff, because it's reciprocal. It's not one way. And the power is reciprocal for the healing. Because anyone who's really a clinician or social service provider, anyone who's really done this work at a deep level, you know and I know that we receive as much as we give. And in most cases, you always get more than you can give. Always, if you're just open. 
The worst client can end up giving you more than you could possibly imagine depart, in parting with them. The worst, most resistant, seemingly hostile. If you're open, there's an opportunity to get much more. And it doesn't even have to be their intention. That's the good news. Even if they don't intend it, if you're open and receptive to the lessons that you need to learn in this relationship, because it's really a relationship. I know we're clinicians. We're taught about boundaries and all of those things, and that's all wonderful, and I'm not suggesting anything other than that. You can have healthy boundaries and create a sense of belonging, folks. You don't have to worry that someone is somehow going to get in your space and mess with your stuff or discover your stuff and then take it and run to the other clients and say, she's got stuff. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. It's okay. It really is. So is that clear for everyone about, you know, the source of the mental health standards and why we use them and the importance of it? And this is all stuff that you can, when you, as you gather and prepare to do this work as trainers, do the additional homework of kind of looking at and, and, and just kind of reflecting on how powerful the tools are that you have. Is there a reason that they're in the order that they're in? Yes. Um, the model is based on human well-being. So you have some people who have studied um, other people. And really the focus with this is um, their child-rearing practices. The reason why they say the Hamblatia, among the Lakota, there is a tradition of posing a question when a child reaches the state of adulthood, of, of passing into adulthood, asking the question, unlike the one that we ask in most traditional communities, we tend to ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know that question, what do you want to be? And even when we're out like dating and stuff, people say, well, what do you do? What's your job? Tell them you're a janitor and see what happens. We ask people, what do you want to be? The Native American practice in this tradition is, how do you want to serve as you grow up? Be, serve. It's a subtle difference, seemingly insignificant, but deeply, deeply rooted in the message that we want to communicate about pro-social values. And you discover how you want to serve as you grow up because you see the needs of the people. You see the needs of those around you. And you're moved by that because you have a sense of belonging. And so this process is informed by real needs with those with whom you are connected, to whom you belong. You have a sense of belonging. And you recognize that it's more than you because if you're moved to another community, the same question persists. It's the same question. How do you want to serve? How will you serve? And so they're given this process they're taken on this journey, and they're taken in, into the forest, to the woods, with little provisions. And it's called a, a vision quest, is what it's actually called. It's a quest for vision. Depending on their state, they may be crying for vision. The people may be crying for vision. And that's what we say of those who are incarcerated. There is a cry for vision. And the idea of attachment as the first mental health standard is that we talk about it as a willingness to see others as unique human beings and to allow them to see you as such. We promote that right from the beginning. We say, show yourself, be transparent. You are who you are. Learn you through that transparency. And we end up with the seventh 
trait of trust, know that when you've gone through all of them, that no matter what hand life deals you, you are going to be well. You are going to be able to handle it. You have the inherent capacity to be well in every situation under every circumstance. So there's an order, yes. As much in the traits or mental health standards as there are in the four quadrants. Belonging is first. Mastery is second because what we do is, and why we call this a strength-based approach, when we encounter people who are in a stage where they are crying for help or in a quest for help, once we have a sense of connectedness, of belonging, the second step is we don't tell them what they don't have. We affirm what they do have. We affirm their mastery. It took mastery to bring them to this occasion. However much your clients may be lacking skills, they had enough skills to get to you. To arrive at your office or your doorstep or wherever you are to be in that prison, they had enough skills to get there. And please don't think that they're not skills because some of us tend to, to think that the clients we work with are skillless. That is not, that nothing could be farther from the truth. And our skills are not superior to theirs. In fact, our skills may, may be inadequate for the task that they've had to encounter and deal with in their lives. So we speak to mastery because we affirm their ability to do whatever's necessary to get where they need to be. The third stage is independence. Because we recognize that though they have had skills that brought them to that occasion, we're going to challenge them to use those skills in ways now that are a bit different than their past. Their skills in the past have brought them to this occasion. Not bad skills, good skills, but in the language of criminogenic needs, poor decision making. So they've not used the skills in ways that are pro-social and healthy and in their best spiritual and moral and emotional interest. So we challenge them through independence to use those skills in ways that are now a bit different than their past circumstance. And the fourth stage is generosity, precisely because what we say, what we suggest to them is that when you get through with all of it, what you're going to discover is that you have more than enough. You're not lacking anything. You have so much that you are now in a position to be generous, to give somebody else some help. And so now you have an obligation to take what you have and use it to empower someone else, to help somebody else. As clinicians... We, ha we also have to be mindful of the rigors of evidence-based practices, evaluations, outcomes. I mean, we have to understand that language. It measures. And so what we've done is we have found a way to integrate what we know works from models of human, holistic human well-being and we've given it curricular structure. We've connected some of the science to the art. That's why I say there's science because we want to know what the research says. You have to know what it says. But you also have to have process that allows people to be well in all of who they are, not just substance abuse, not just the issue of them being in prison, they have been alcoholic. They, that's, those, that's, that's the footnote. When you really get into this work, the label that brought them there is the footnote. It's, and for when you've really reached a point where you understand it, it's no longer even a footnote. 